Thank you for visiting the sculpture of the suffragette Emily Wilding Davison. This film has been created to tell you more about Emily and highlights different parts of the sculpture's design and their significance to her story. We hope it gives you a sense of the important role she played in enabling women to gain the vote in the UK. Surrey sculptor Christine Charlesworth created this statue of Emily Wilding Davison to commemorate not just her tragic death at the 1913 Derby, but also her intelligence, courage and dedication in serving the cause of women's rights. Christine wanted Emily to be approachable, which is why she's life-sized and seated on a bench with room to sit beside her. The contemporary feel of the pale granite bench contrasts with her traditional bronze figure, symbolising the connection between the struggles for equality in the past and present. Emily was born on the 11th of October 1872 in Blackheath, London, to Charles and Margaret Davison, who were originally from Northumberland. The third of four children born to the couple, Emily also had nine half-brothers and sisters from her father's first marriage. Her early life was comfortable and relatively privileged. Emily was academically gifted and deeply religious. You can see three of her favourite books, the Bible, a book of Walt Whitman's poetry, and Chaucer's A Golden Key, which is an illustrated book of the Canterbury Tales, stacked next to her on the bench. At 21, she won a scholarship to attend Royal Holloway College to read English language and literature. But tragedy struck when her father died. Unable to pay the fees, she had to leave and find work. She taught at several schools before taking a position as a governess in Northamptonshire. In 1895, Emily enrolled at St Hugh's College, Oxford, to complete the course she had begun at Royal Holloway and obtained a first-class honours award that same year. However, Oxford did not award degrees to women, so she was unable to graduate. She went on to study as an external student at the London University in 1902, passing an intermediate exam in the arts in 1906. 1906 was a pivotal year for Emily. She had a passion for social justice, particularly the plight of women who had few rights over their own lives. She saw gaining the right to vote as essential and joined the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU. You can see her membership badge on her lapel. A year later, she left her governor's post to take on an increasing role within the organisation, eventually volunteering full time. In 1908, Emily was finally awarded a first class honours degree in modern languages at the University of London. She can be seen on a march, proudly wearing her mortarboard and gown and holding the degree certificate that she had waited so long for. You can see her mortarboard placed next to her on the bench on top of her books. On the 30th of March 1909, Emily was arrested for assaulting a policeman during a march to see Prime Minister Herbert Henry Asquith. She received the first of nine prison sentences and went on to be convicted for crimes such as interrupting men-only public meetings and throwing stones at windows in ministerial cars. Emily was also the first suffragette to set fire to pillar boxes in Parliament Square. Emily went on her first hunger strike that same year in protest at the prison's refusal to treat suffragettes as political prisoners. She was released after losing nine and a half kilos in weight in five and a half days. Emily went on hunger strike a total of seven times and was force fed 49 times, an experience she likened to torture. You can see her hunger strike medal with the seven bars on her jacket and her Holloway brooch on the front frill of her blouse. In an effort to avoid another force feeding, Emily barricaded herself in her cell. The prison authorities broke a window and trained a water cannon on her for around 15 minutes. Her cell ended up six inches deep in water and Emily had to be admitted to the prison hospital with hypothermia. After warming her up, they once again force fed her. She successfully sued the prison for her mistreatment. According to accounts, Emily had a smile that could light up a room. Unfortunately, force feeding caused her to lose several teeth and suffer paralysis on one side of her face, which is why she's rarely seen smiling in photographs. However, in the statue, Christine has shown Emily as if in conversation, with a glint of humour in her eyes. On Census Day, 2nd of April 1911, Emily managed to access the Palace of Westminster for the third time, hiding overnight in a broom cupboard. 
She was discovered by a cleaner and arrested, but not charged. As a result, she was included in the census return for Parliament. You can see the census form in Emily's left hand. Emily showed great resilience in the face of adversity. However, it is clear from her own writing and other accounts that her experiences took their toll. Repeatedly imprisoned and force-fed, she became increasingly desperate, on one occasion throwing herself off the prison balcony in protest at the treatment of fellow suffragettes, badly injuring herself. Her despair at the lack of progress on women's rights ultimately led to the act that ended with her untimely death. On the 4th of June 1913, Emily bought a return train ticket from London to Epsom Downs to attend the Derby. She waited next to the railings within sight of the Pathé cameras that were filming the race, and she had two suffragette scarves pinned to the lining of her coat. Towards the end of the race, King George V's horse, Anma, was near the back of the pack as they rounded Tattenham Corner. As it approached, Emily ducked under the railings and ran in front of the horse with her arms up. Anma sent her flying, and the horse and jockey fell, but neither was seriously injured. Unconscious, Emily was taken to the cottage hospital in Epsom, where she never regained consciousness and died of her injuries four days later. The tragic incident was caught on camera and broadcast around the world. Emily was described as a heroine by her fellow suffragettes and a mad woman by many in the establishment. The inquest described her death as accidental and due to misadventure, although we'll never know exactly what Emily's intentions were that day, some now believe she wanted to petition the King in front of the cameras at Tattenham Corner. On the 14th of June 1913, Emily's body was taken from Epsom to London, where she was accompanied by 5,000 suffragettes, and the streets were lined with 50,000 onlookers. She was taken by train to Morpeth, where she was buried in the family plot of St Mary Virgin Church. Her headstone reads, Deeds, not words. In 1918, Five years after Emily's death, property-owning women over the age of 30 were given the vote. In 1928, women over 21 were included. But it was not until 1968 that all women over 18 were finally able to vote. At the centenary of Emily's death in 2013, a ceremony was held at Epsom Racecourse, attended by family members and dignitaries from Epsom and Morpeth. A plaque was installed on the railings where she stood to commemorate her death. The Emily Davis Memorial Project hopes that Emily's permanent presence in the centre of Epsom will not only act as a reminder to her role in the fight for gender equality, but also as an inspiration to future generations of activists in their ongoing struggle to gain equal rights for all.